Amen. <coughs> Do not go gentle into the night. Old age should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Dylan Thomas, a poet, advises us to rage against death. One, the way one journeys into death, how one dies, stands as a witness to whom one is. So is rage and fighting death the only way to go? And what does the way we die say about us? Another author, Frederick Duramont, described four ways of dying in his 1951 radio play, A Nocturnal Conversation with a Despised Person. His play is sent behind the armed curtain and involves only two characters. The first is a writer who has spent his whole life protesting against the regime in the name of human freedom and decency. Others fear to associate with him, and so he lives alone, in isolation, anxiously awaiting his arrest and trial. The second character is the executioner. Fifty years ago, he committed a crime, and in exchange for his own life, he has become the state's executioner. Initially, he only terminated the lives of those in jail, but now he's sent out on assignments to eliminate those outside of the system. For the writer, it's important that he has a last audience to hear the truth of his lifelong struggles. So when the executioner knocks on the door in the middle of the night, the writer is distraught. There will be no one to hear his arguments, and he was hoping for a public trial. In a furious outrage, he throws open the windows to shout for help, to yell out protests, to scream his truths one more time. No one responds. For the executioner, it is important how a person dies, the way and the why of it. <coughs> so he shares his experiences of death with the writer. Scoundrels, he teaches, resist as violently as they can. This makes sense to him. Violent criminals meeting death with violence is natural. It adds up. Others made magnificent speeches on freedom and justice, and cold shivers would run up and down the spine of the executioner. But these criminals claimed indifference to death, but they fought with anger and scorn. And hate and war grew up between the executioner and the condemned. Anger was met with anger, and there was an imposing <coughs> death. But the executioner was the only witness, and he was not changed by the wrathful rhetoric. Some, confess the executioner, die like an animal, passively, like being led to slaughter. There is no defiance or resistance, and this, sense, this death makes no sense at all to the executioner. People should not accept the end of their lives with such passivity. There is a fourth way, continues the executioner, to die humbly, yielding not with the indifference of an animal, nor with the resignation, nor with exhaustion, not with anxiety either. 
Now, a guilty criminal accepting his death this way made sense to the executioner. But he had discovered, remarkably, that innocent people die that way too. The executioner knew for certain that his blow would befall an innocent person, and it was unfair. These deaths to him were incomprehensible, and he hated himself for the role that he played. He discovered that a person who, in the hour of his unjust death, lays aside his pride and anxiety, even his rights, in order to die like a child without cursing the world, is actually <coughs> a victor. Their humble yielding seemed to encompass even the executioner in a prayer of peace. While contradicting reason, it revealed the powerlessness of injustice. The executioner could take someone's body, but he could not take the truth that their life stood for. Platitudes, says the writer, and yet he knows that it does come down to a final confrontation between using force to get one's way and a deeper goodness, which will not use this force. He has lived his whole life opposed to the unjust use of power, never seeking to get his own way by force. And now all that is left is a final choice of how to die. To choose to die humbly is to continue to resist injustice. He yields to the executioner's unjust blow. And through this humble allegiance with justice becomes joined to a deeper goodness, which cannot be touched by the force that takes its life. Dearmont's story is fiction, and I have certainly not been present at any execution. But this story rings true with my own pastoral experience of death. Death comes in all shapes and, and sizes. This week I was at a funeral for Shirley Walker, and she did not have time to choose her death. She ended her life in a car accident. She probably had a medical condition that caused her to pass out while she was driving. And for many of these people that are suddenly gone, taken by a force of nature like tornadoes and earthquakes, or in the blink of an eye in a traffic or train or boating accident or caught up in violence and taken by a bullet or explosion, they have no choice. But others have time to make a decision. Some rail against their death. They're angry at God. They're angry at their circumstances. And they take that anger out on all of those around them. And there's no time for peace or reconciliation or even saying goodbye. Others work through their grief. And they come to a point of acceptance. And they want to make a difference with the time they have left. One woman I know raised money for research so that maybe a cure or treatment could be found and others would not have to suffer the way she did. Another wrote the diary for her young daughters so that when they matured, they would have messages of love to turn to. Many chose to show where God is in the equation, highlighting moments of kindness. Doctors who went beyond expectations and when I went to visit them to console them, I came away unexpectedly consoled and strengthened myself. They chose to remain steadfastly in God's love, and death could not penetrate their goodness. It could not strip the meaning from their lives. Rather, it was like they had opened up the curtain to God's kingdom. And then slipped through that space, somersaulting between this life on earth and the greater life totally in God's embrace. 
These people show us that to die without anxiety, pride, or scorn, even when one is unjustly violated by disease or circumstances, is to participate ultimately in God's goodness, which is beyond the reach of any force. As we Christians move into the week that defines our faith, we remember and relive Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus entered Jerusalem peacefully on a donkey. He came as a king of persuasion and nonviolence. He came knowing his final destination was the cross and execution by crucifixion. He chose to die humbly. Today we talked about Jesus' arrest and trial. They came for him at night, which was irregular. Judas led the parade of priests and teachers and of the law and the elders, and they waved swords and clubs, not palm branches. This was a parade of betrayal with a potential for violence. One of the servant's ears was cut off in the melee, and Jesus asked, Am I such a dangerous criminal that you have to come after me with weapons? The disciples scattered, and one even fled naked. Jesus went with his captors humbly, not passively, not with exhausted resignation, but with humility and certainty. And at the trial, before the 71 righteous men of the Sanhedrin, no two witnesses could agree, even when they um, tried to lie. They're, they couldn't get their stories straight. And without two collaborating testimonies, they would not be able to convict him. In response to all of these accusations, Jesus was silent. <clears throat> Respectively, silent. Vexed, the chief priest asked him directly, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? I am, Jesus replied. Not I am he, or I am the son of the blessed, just I am. His answer reverberates with the same conviction of God's answers to Moses. Moses, wanting proof that he had conversed with God, asked God his name. And the answer that came back was, I am who I am. After that, Jesus quotes from the book of Dan, chapter 7, verse 13, a passage that tells of a future Messiah ruling in glory. And Jesus acknowledges his special relationship with God modestly, but assuredly. And the chief priest loses it and tears his clothing and levels the conviction of blasphemy. This divine drama that continues on beyond the trial all the way to the cross is meant to communicate God's way to us. It is meant to show us the full extent of God's love. We are meant to see our apathy towards suffering in the disciples that fell asleep. We are meant to find parts of ourselves in that store sword wheeling crowd and acknowledge our violence within. We are meant to, reckon, to recognize our own cowardliness in the disciples that ran away. We can see our own misplaced loyalties and striving for power in the actions of the priests and the elders. We are meant to find ourselves in this story and be moved by its tragic ending. We are meant to realize that there is something deeply wrong with us, that we are broken and are in need of forgiveness. We are also meant to see the love of the one who suffers for us as well as his determination to save us from ourselves and from our sin. <coughs> Through his suffering and death, Jesus demonstrates a love 
that refuses to give in or give up. He does not meet violence with violence. He does not meet anger with anger. He does not die passively. He dies humbly. And his sacrificial love transforms enemies into friends. It moves the guilty to repentance. It melts hearts of stone. And the world is transformed. We are meant to hear this story and be transformed also and begin to practice such a love. What does the Lord require of us? Not to rage and rage against the dying of the light, but to love, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God, even into our death. Amen.